Hi, uh, my name is Paul. I am the uh, CISO for Echo Star. I've been there two months, six days, and like three hours. <laughs> I haven't solved any of the world's problems, but it's a great place to work, and uh, it's going to be interesting times in the next year or two with the strategy we're pushing forward. So uh, my main job here is to keep you guys awake since you just had lunch. <laughs> All right. So if you want to stand, stretch, you know, go for a jog around campus, that's fine too. Um, and the, one of the things I wanted to make sure we do is we speak in plain English. There's a lot of acronyms being thrown around, and I think there's certain folks here who probably don't know what the acronyms are and won't and will, um, and try to Google it. You know, in, in the room where we can only get 4G right now. So, um, yeah, apropos uh, statement there, by the way, for the first question coming up. So let's just speak in plain English. And if anybody uh, didn't know what IoT meant from that esteemed gentleman from the last, uh, 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 the last, <coughs> from the last panel, that's Internet of Things. So it's like your smart refrigerator, let's say. So, uh, and with that, I just wanted to start with uh, introductions. And Chris. Hello, everybody. My name is Chris Calvert, and I am the Director of Solutions Innovation with HP's Enterprise Security Products, which basically means I get to make things up for a living, which is quite a bit of fun. <laughs> Pass that on. Thank you. Hey, everyone. Uh, my name is Greg Foss. I'm the uh, Head of Security Operations for Logarithm uh, right here in Boulder. My name is Garrett Padgham. I'm the Principal and Owner of Electric Alchemy, a security consulting firm out of Denver. Spend a lot of time breaking things. I'm Joe McManus, and I run the network security program here at IPP, and I'm also a uh, senior researcher at the Software Engineers Institute at Carnegie Mellon. I think I think this is a little easier. Yeah, so, there we go. <laughs> uh, I've got four questions uh, for our esteemed panel over here. And I love the fact that we're all dressed very Colorado casual. So, <laughs> yeah. so for anybody from Washington, D.C., this is how you dress out here. Um, so question number one. Be clear yourself. <laughs> except for you. Yeah. So question number one, what are the top vulnerabilities in telecom backbone technologies? Uh, we're talking IP, LTE, DOCSIS. I know I'm talking acronyms, but that's what it says here. And I'll push it over to you, Chris. Um, so... I tend to go back cultural first before we talk engineering, and I think the, the most pervasive vulnerability is one of availability bias. So rather than talking about the actual technology vulnerabilities, oh, there are you know, many of them, all of the protocols and all of the things that work in telecommunications networks are unencrypted and unauthenticated. And so what that means is we do perimeter security. And what does that sound like? That sounds like the 90s. Right? That sounds like the 1990s for information security. So, you know, talking about some of the vulnerabilities, the real vulnerability is we never get to patch because of that availability bias. Security engineers are never allowed, at least in my experience, and again, everything I say is from my experience, are never allowed to touch core network components because of that high availability bias. So you don't end up doing a lot of engineering. I'll give you one example of a vulnerability that I know of that exists in the telecommunications network that nobody has patched and it's been out there 10, 15 years. Um, and there's a thing called GTP, which is the GPRS tunneling protocol. And that's how your, your phone gets out to the internet when you go and surf a web page or look at anything. Well, that external interface basically just encodes GTP and translates it out to the packet radio network. Well, if you double encode a GTP packet, it gets caught in a loop and causes that external device to lock up and crash. Uh, attack against availability. And the only reason that's not been fixed is we don't patch, we don't touch things in core networks because of what I call this availability bias. No, I definitely agree with that, Chris. And I, I think to add on to that too, I mean, there's limited options for consumers, really. I mean, we're very forced into going with certain brands, going with certain companies. So there's very little incentive for them on their end to actually build these systems securely. Um, so there's lots of very critical uh, issues within cable networks and, you know, like Doxis is a, is a great example of that. And it's, it's funny when you talk about vulnerabilities just for telecom, it's actually very similar to just the vulnerabilities we see in all the other products, except they just don't get as much visibility, really. 
And so I guess to add on that, more um, shying away from the, the technical answer to this um, and going back to business, I think one of the biggest vulnerabilities is the push of business to push feature, 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 feature all the time. And they're engineering and they're, they're building fast because their product managers are pushing all this stuff and they don't have time to really understand the implications of what they're building. And it may not necessarily be that there's a, a technical vulnerability there, but they have a logic problem. Um, going back to the whole AT&T disclosure from we, you know, add one to a number and you get an email address. Like, that's not a really a technical vulnerability. It's a business logic issue. Um, so go into that, and then there's other things like um, just being able to um, do things like man-in-the-middle infrastructure. Um, T-Mobile just ruled out these femto cells that you can get now if you have um, poor reception. So, okay, I hook it up to my broadband um, cable modem or whatever in my house, and now I have five bars of of service in my house for LTE, that's great. But what happens if I stick a device between the femto cell and my my internet connection and, and start sniffing that traffic? What's it look like? What happens when my neighbor is now connecting to my femto cell because they have T-Mobile too? <laughs> um, go on from that. That's actually a great point. I, I happen to um, live in the mountains, so I have a femto cell in my house, nice. and it's all IPsec. <laughs> I put a tap on it trying to figure it out. Um, but to the, to the point, um, I think some of the problems we face with the telecom um, backbone is that we still have so much of legacy hardware in, in place. Um, bring that up to up to current standards. I think we've sort of ignored some of the problems that are there because, well, it hasn't broken yet. So we, we move on. We put new things, but don't take the old gear out. And then I think uh, Chris from AT&T, uh, you had mentioned using um, using mm -hmm. Flow to monitor mm -hmm. large scale networks. And I think with telecom, we have such, I mean, there's just such a, a large amount of bandwidth coming across. We're not seeing, um, we're not doing analytics in real time or near real time, so more deployment of things like flow. And then, as you guys have all mentioned too, um, we have to we have to make sure that things can talk to each other, that my that my T-Mobile phone can talk to your AT&T phone and so mm -hmm. forth. And so because of this sharing environment, we kind of, the business has said, okay, make sure things can talk, but we'll secure it later. Mm -hmm. So that's a, that's a big problem. Yeah, no, I, I would agree with that. Like, so, how many people in here have seen Stingrays in real life? Yes, excellent, awesome, I like this room. So it's like, I mean, that's like a very easy thing to build now. There's instructions out on the internet where you can actually make one of these out of equipment you can buy on Amazon or Newegg and stuff like that. So I mean, it effectively lowers the bar to entry into man in the middle in uh, essentially cell phone traffic. Even though I would point out that's illegal. <laughs> this is true. This is it's true. <laughs> Only if you get caught. It's <laughs> good to point out. I know there's a couple of cops in here, so. <laughs> yeah, you know, from my perspective, working, in, uh, I guess, in the industry and being the leader of information security, uh, uh, I always get back. It's, it's about our people. It's about culture, and it's also all about the business. We need to prove the value of inserting security from the, at development, not at deployment. There's a monetary value, there's a grant protection value, there's lots of value, especially these days with all these breaches, privacy issues with uh, the NSA and everything else that happened. Uh, it's, it's almost a marketing tool. So part of my job is to market security for the business so we can have that awareness at the development level rather than again at the deployment where maybe one of our esteemed colleagues here sees a security hole and now we're embarrassed. So it's the last thing we want. So moving on, um, question number two. With the recent high profile security shortfalls in open source projects like OpenSSL, Heartbleed, um, is relying on open source technology enough or should part of its use be contributing back to the open source community to address security issues? Let's <coughs> answer that loaded question. <laughs> okay. uh, that one's fairly hard to answer. There's a lot of nuance when you start talking about open source. In general, I'm a huge fan. Um, but one of the things I'd point out, a lot of these highly proprietary telecommunications pieces of equipment, they're things like BSC, space station controllers, and all of these, they all have open source projects around them as well. Where the ham radio community and where the, you know, the telecommunications community hobbyists are playing with these devices that can mimic the, the components of these core networks. Um, and in fact, this is where Stingray comes from. This was the invention out of that sort of hobbyist community. So our security through obscurity, I think, has been well and truly 
you know, proven to not be effective. But there's a lot of nuance in terms of what you can find in the open source community as core components and, and you know, how we secure a, a, you know, an open source project. One of the things that I see a lot of vendors in the community doing is lending their security tools to the open source projects for free and allowing them to do source code scanning and such in order to identify vulnerabilities that may be introduced into this source code in the open source community. So as always, you know, use with you know, a little bit of common sense, which of course we in technology don't do very well. <laughs> <laughs> no, I I'd, I'd agree with that. And like another aspect of this too is, I mean, think about a lot of our, our commercial tools that we use, they're dependent on open source libraries 90% of the time. And that's something, you know, you'll look at the code within your own application, you'll evaluate that, you'll have static analysis, dynamic analysis, pen testing, all those good things there. But I mean, if you aren't evaluating those third-party libraries and the other aspects that are tied into these co in, into your application, you're not seeing the whole picture. Now, the hard part there is getting buy-in from people to do analysis of open source projects too, because there's limited incentive there. So I mean, that's another just problem with uh, you know technology in general. Is I mean, it's great that people build these things, but it's hard to you know have that quality control in the same way that we do in like the commercial environments. I also think it goes back to uh, a risk-based program approach as well. Um, dealing with, with software that, that may be questionable in terms of its integrity of, of who contributes to it, what type of source um, is, is there, and, and what that software may be doing, and, and applying that possibly to your most business critical systems um, could have some implications there. Um, but on the same side, and, and to play the devil's advocate on myself, um, open source technology and software tends to have more eyes looking at it. That's not necessarily a good thing. I guarantee you I can look at open SSL libraries and I would be able to find a crypto bug in there if my life depended on it. Um, it's just the math is, is above and beyond me. But the question is, um, are the right people looking at it? And from an identity perspective of who's contributing to these projects, are they who they say they are even? Um, there's, there's a whole lot of questions and I don't think there's, a, there's an easy answer there. Um, the open source community, the last part of that question, um, if we use open source software, should we um, responsibly um, contribute back to that project. I think absolutely. Um, just as a, you're using it, and you're not, you know, you're you're getting something for free, so to speak, um, and, and contributing back to the community. Community is an important part of making that software better for everyone. Yeah, I agree with what everyone said. I think um, with open source software these days, it's sort of changed from what we remember in the '80s and '90s as shareware. Um, <laughs> where we've got companies now like Red Hat, IBM, putting a serious serious you know financial um, investment into open source right I mean AX is really nowhere they're putting everything into into Linux so you have now you're getting some structure um, to open source tools where before you had a little bit a little bit less um, structure a little more wild west so now yeah, you will find a bug with something like open SSL and heartbleed because you know, it's an all software eventually something will happen and that was interesting when it was a very short release period that it existed um, but then you also have some great uh, software coming out of national labs. Um, so like if anyone here has used Silk or Yap, they're open source software funded by DOD and DHS that's released uh, open source. Um, and then when, you, when we've talked about things uh, like uh, Internet of Things today, and you think about an embedded device or even a, a, like a Cisco router, I mean, they're built on open source software. But one of the problems we see there is it's not open source that's the problem. You'll find a vulnerability, but they were built configured, patched, custom software is written on top, and this custom software isn't, isn't, in, the, um, isn't in the regular update chain, so the vendor's not releasing um, current patches that you would do if you were just running a Linux box and could do the yum update or something like that. Um, you have the problem where it's five versions behind. There is a very expensive and complicated network monitoring system uh, uh, by Vivio that was like five revisions behind Red Hat. It was Red Hat 7 when Red Hat 14 was out. So. Um, that's one of the problems you run into when people are building on open source and not keeping uh, current in the update chain. Okay, any other comments on open source? Okay, great. Well, well moving on. Um, as most vulnerability in cybersecurity exists in software, how are regulatory agencies address these risks? Another loaded question. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, FCC people. This seems like the wrong audience for that question. Um, 
my experience has been that one, you know, I'm speaking to PCI that the industry is better able to regulate itself than the government is to apply regulation. But what the government, and, and again, you're getting Calvert opinion, but it, what the government has done is drive budget to the solutions by having a regulation at all. By the fact that people are looking and people are demanding that we secure these things, that we make them available, and things like 911 services are not interrupted. Now, hold on, wait a minute. Didn't I talk about availability bias a second ago? 911 <laughs> has to be there. So now we have a regulatory availability bias, which makes it even harder to patch. So. I don't really know the answer. I think we have a really hard balance to figure out between those two, I guess. <laughs> Was that a terrible? <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, it, this is a tough question, I think. Because, um, I mean, it just depends on how you look at regulation. Because there's some regulation that I think is important mm -hmm. and very necessary. Some of it is, con you know, misconstrued. And, you know, you have to have people that really understand the core technologies that they're trying to implement these regulations around. And I think that's what it really comes down to. And naturally, one of the things we're seeing with, you know, incidents coming about, like all the recent breaches that have happened this year, you know, within healthcare and things like that, I think these types of things are actually what's going to spur a lot of this regulation anyway, like whether it comes out of the company or from the government or what have you, I think somehow naturally there's going to be regulation in some form because there has to be, because some of these companies have to be held liable for not protecting your information. Like I just got my OPM letter. I mean, that's something... You know, it probably affects a lot of us in here. And that's something that I think there should be something they're held accountable for in some way. Yeah, uh, <laughs> regulations. I, I, I probably will be the one to say that I don't like them the most amongst uh, all of us. Um, the, the question comes down to how do you make someone care about something they wouldn't normally care about? Um, uh, whether you, you scare them into a thud, fear, uncertainty, and doubt, <laughs> Um, or you actually cause them to sit down and have a good discussion with them and say, this is the risk your business faces. Um, and I think that's the more important conversation to have. Um, and then the question is, well, how are we dealing with this risk from the business perspective, not from an IT perspective? It's all encompassing. Um, so we really um, need to take the, the, the regulations that are there and, and make them so Pliable. Um, the guy from Kindle Lab said earlier that, that any standard that doesn't work for any business, you need to be able to mold it and apply it to the, the relevant business entities so that it's just not a draconian, you need to do X, Y, and Z to be <laughs> secure because obviously we've seen from all kinds of breaches who, of companies that are PCI compliant that uh, just explode. So, so um, I think regulations and standards both have a place. And if you're talking about PCI, which is a great example, um, PCI is a great set of common sense things to secure your infrastructure, whether you're actually doing payment card industry um, data or not. It's just it's logging, it's access control, it's two-factor authentication. But unfortunately, most people do it once a year before they're audited. So it has to be sort of living. Um, I think certain things could benefit from a standard. So do our internet connected light bulbs, do they need to meet a certain uh, regulatory requirement, or could you just buy them by saying this one meets, you know, <laughs> light bulb standard A, B, or C for security. <laughs> um, but then where we do need regulation, obviously HIPAA. Things can, now that so many things are connected to patients in hospitals, you, we don't want them going down when someone runs an NMAP scan trying to secure the network, which is, which is you know, something that does happen. These things are so poorly written, they're built on little tiny network stacks, they, they fall down. Um, something hooked up to, you know, the, the, the power grid, you know, we, we always talk about the smart grid, which will one day come into place. Um, but when they do the smart grid, we need to make sure that these are a certain, uh, you know, meet a certain security requirement, I think. Your home connected refrigerator maybe meets a standard, not a requirement. Yeah, there's definitely some basis for that. Uh, you know, we've already identified what critical infrastructure is uh, in many different industries in this country. And yeah, definitely. Regulatory, nuclear, uh, energy, uh, you, know, you name it. Uh, in reference to standards, we already have the healthcare. Uh, what a lot of companies or businesses like mine struggle with is which one to go with. You've got right now NIST, ISO 27000, you've got SANS out there, and, and it's almost a hodgepodge. So um, a lot of businesses like ours have standards, but it's a, it's a, 
it's really a mix of uh, all the best practices out of all the standards that are out there. And uh, with us, we have ITAR, um, it's some serious stuff, so we definitely comply with that because it's, it's all about missiles and warheads. So, uh, I guess from a business perspective, regulations are, uh, I guess the best way to put it, annoying. Uh, but from uh, an enterprise perspective, a risk management perspective, and frankly, a national security perspective, it's, just ne it's, a, it's a necessary thing that has to be out there. We just need to figure out which ones are working and which ones are not, which we just don't do. Okay, moving on, we're gonna flip the coin and uh, should telecom providers require end users and customers, this will be funny, to secure <laughs> endpoints. So to, for them to secure their own endpoints. Uh, how would you monitor and enforce that? I, I guess I would use an analogy, right? The National Highway Safety Board requires my provider to provide me a safe vehicle. Um, I think the operating systems that are provided to people the platforms that are provided to people should be provided as securely as possible. With the millions of lines of code and the, the bias towards feature creation rather than securing those features, um, are we going to have to secure them for ourselves? Yeah, but can we? I don't know. I think that's very difficult. Yeah, I think, I think that's the thing is right now in the current technology <laughs> landscape, that's impossible to enforce because we have so many people that have, you know, very deprecated technology at home and I mean, it's just that's how it is and we can't expect everyone to have you know the most up-to-date most current technology at home but I think going forward that's something you know we can think about and bake that into the products that we're selling to consumers because you know if, if people like say you can get a computer for your grandma that's gonna self-update it's gonna sell you know just check against all these things it's not gonna let her do something like maybe set a setting or something that's gonna restrict you know, installing certain programs or something, or opening ports or whatever, you know? Maybe it skims her email real quick, I don't know. <laughs> but I think right now, you know, currently, that's something that's very difficult to enforce. So. Yeah, so I, I read this this question last night and I paraphrased it to myself. How do you secure grandma? <laughs> um, and and it's, a, it's a huge question, um, given the, the, the general layman um, attitude of, of the, the populace in and of itself. So I think the only way to, to go about doing that is, is securing the tools that they use um, and through operating systems, through software. Um, and, and a lot of that goes back to, well, how do we do that? And when you start looking at root causes of vulnerabilities and software and stuff, where's the best place to fix those? Well, you fix them before they even come. Um, and it goes back, um, as I said earlier, into our educational programs and getting good software engineers who are, are security aware from the, the get-go, not just, I want to build a product to do X and Y, but I want to do a product to do X and Y securely. Um, so in, in today's ecosystem and the way that works, I think it's really hard. I've seen ISPs try um, you know, offering free antivirus software. We all know how well that works mm -hmm. um, to, to secure endpoints and enforce that type of thing. Um, yeah, not, not a great solution. Maybe it's better than nothing, but um, I think there's a lot of improvement to be made in this area. Um, so I, I agree with you guys. I think, um, I, think I think we need to put some responsibility, um, but not put some responsibility back. I think we could um, ask for some help from the telecom providers. If you want to think about um, just some of the improvements in the last five years, when you used to get a wireless, um, a, a cable modem was built in wireless. The password was probably the you know Comcast or something like that. And at least now they're they're unique passwords per installment with unique SSIDs. So we're seeing some improvement there. But to the point of putting AV on, um, you know, giving free AV out to your customers. Well, it's free for three months, then it stops working. So I'm I'm a big fan of securing at the network layer. Maybe we have to make these, um, you know, free home firewalls have some um, intrusion prevention and intrusion detection built into them. Um, it's been mentioned, everybody here I think has been mentioned securing grandma. Well, an example I tell in uh, all of our security classes here is that um, I'm half Italian, and so every three months, my mom sends me a forward that says, you know your Italian if. One of the jokes is eating salad after dinner instead of before. But anyhow, at the bottom of that email, it says, click on this, and it's usually some link to some spam. So every six months, she sends me your laptop to erase it and reinstall the OS. Um, 
I think it's a grand failure on my part, but that's all right. So you know, how, do, how do we fix that? And it's, it's, I think part of it is education to the consumer. How do we make it understandable to the average person, to grandma, to my mom? Um, as you said, you know, how do we get developers making better software? Right? We have two secure um, coding classes in the ITP tracks that we're doing here. But um, <laughs> well, you know, we need to bake that in. When I've been in discussions with companies, when it comes to um, you know, project planning sessions, Security is not there. When you say, hey, we should build this feature in now. It's going to cost this much less to do it now than when we backport it later. It was, well, especially if you're a startup, our customers don't care. We need features, 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 <coughs> not security. No, security doesn't sell. We need to help change that mindset. Yeah, if I could just add to that, one of the things we've seen work really well in the enterprise is end user training. And now, like all these major breaches that are actually affecting people personally, that is some good training. But I mean, there's more we could do there by educating them better than just saying, hey, your card was stolen, get identity monitoring. You know, we could actually put some proactive stuff out there, like, hey, here's what some example emails that you might get look like. Here's like, you know, some of the stuff that all of us are hit with all the time that, you know, like, hate to say it, but grandma falls for, unfortunately. You know, and that's, that's something that I think is, is very important, is the educational aspect of it. And I guess to play devil's advocate on that, uh, do you actually enjoy taking those classes in here? So how do we how do we make this entertaining and valuable to our end users as well, and not just an annual thing that we go, oh, I got to do this again. Yes, I'm not going to click on the email. And blah blah blah. Um, so there's there's some creativity opportunities there, I think, to certainly make things better. Um, but then, you know. How do we get that out even to the masses, not just the, the large enterprises that can that are pushing that out to their employees, but the small and medium businesses as well, and, and the, the, the mom that works from home and stuff like that. So, so um, I think, you know, as you said, we're seeing these hacks, Target, Home Depot, you think these would start affecting the consumer, but they're not. They just said, well, keep up my car, and the bank covers it. And it's kind of interesting that for the first time, uh, Target is actually going to be held accountable instead of that uh, instead of the card um, instead of the card issuer because they ignored so many alerts in their SIM. So I think with something like that, at least you know, industry needs to start paying attention. If industry starts paying attention, hopefully the consumer will. But for now, it's just nobody. It's just, I don't think the average user cares about. Ah, my card gets stolen. Well, my bank will send me an email, and it's not going to bother me. Yeah. Well, do you? The other fun fact there, anyone watch the stock market when these breaches happen? They go up. It's a great time to buy. Company gets hacked, buy some stock. <laughs> I've long since given up on the end user. Um, I'll give you an anecdote just on this. Uh, and Really, we did a, we did a study as, as an engagement at one point where we did telephone solicitation of a, it was a car dealer model where we would call in the car dealer and try to get them to give us access. We did a statistical study on how many people responded. Then we conducted a whole series of end user training, and yes, it was horribly boring, I'm sure. <laughs> uh, and then we did another study, and we got a higher response rate in terms of people giving us credentials. So anecdotally, not statistically, <coughs> but anecdotally, I think we have to give them better tools. We can't expect them to figure it out. Yeah, yeah in support of that, I mean, one of the things I think we should do as an industry is, uh, and again, I look at this purely from a business and marketing perspective where um, people will come to you and buy your products because you're enabling them, but uh, put out a, a buffet of risk-based packages. Uh, like you said, if, uh, if you're buying a system for your 89-year-old grandmother, buy package A, whatever that might be. If it's for your 20-year-old son who's uh, got a computer programming degree, then buy package D. Um, you know, with the developer box next to it or something like that. But I mean, you don't see that smorgasbord. It's always just, you know, one shoe, one foot, all sizes. So I think eventually we're going to start evolving where people are going to see, marketers are going to see business opportunities in reference to that. And they're going to see customer stickiness because of that stuff. In addition to that, um, and this is a more of a much more top down approach, but yeah, as, uh, as my colleague said, Target is being held accountable. Not only Target, but the board of directors, these industry giants who pull all the strings are getting sued personally on the civil side. And you know there's criminal investigations going on. Uh, no one's talking about. So when these board members start seeing that they're gonna, they may be personally liable 
they start waking up. And that's what's I think happening to the industry right now. And they're using Target, they're using a lot of these other examples to say we need to make some adjustments in first bringing in a security team that's enterprise focused and not siloed in a vertical or just one product. And we need to figure out uh, how to get security in from the get go rather than at the end, end state. Uh, because that's short-term thinking, and when you get to the board level, it's all about long-term thinking. Five, ten-year plan. Are we going to be here in 20 years? What are we going to look like? Well, what are we going to look like if we have a huge breach and you know, um, you know, and our business fails because of it, and we're all being sued, uh, you know, uh, up and down. So, I think it's coming. Unfortunately, it, it, it always comes after a significant event uh, like Target and others. Just gonna take some time because it's human nature. Uh, those are all the questions. Um, I really wanted to get through quick so we have like a good, robust discussion with the crowd out here. So we've got a good 28 minutes to really argue about everything they, they stated. <laughs> the question I would ask is. Since you wind up getting so much false email and trying to talk you into giving out security, how do you know you're trusting a secure service that really is one instead of someone false taking your data? Well, I'll start with that. At the, at the high end, um, anybody can be fished. With the appropriate amount of social reconnaissance, which, by the way, is sort of all the rage these days, looking at your LinkedIn, looking at your Facebook, looking at your social profile, I can write you an email where you will click on the link. Um, at the broader spam level, you've just got to, if it came to you and you didn't solicit it, don't click on it. Yeah, yeah I mean, that, that's a good question because it's a, hard, it's a hard problem to solve, really, because, I mean, even all of us up here could be fished easily. I mean, it's, it's just you have to have a good pretext, and it's believable, and, you know, you, you can get anyone to click on some stuff. Like, we had a guy leave our company, so we were messing with him all week until he left, and so we fished him constantly, he kept clicking on stuff. And it, but, I mean, you can do this to anyone, as long as there's a good pretext, as long as you know enough about your target. And in today's age, it's trivial to gather that information. There's so much out there on the Internet. Um, so the hard part, I mean, I mean, personally for me, I try and not trust anything. Like we, we've had, um, we've had a huge issue with wire fraud scams that were targeting certain people in finance organizations that we work with. And so what we did there, I mean, it was so prevalent and some of them got very close to actually paying these people, um, doing wire transfers outside the company. They had to implement physical security controls. Like, Hey, go talk to this person physically. If you can't do that, don't do the transfer. I mean, these are just some of the steps we had to take to mitigate some of this threat. I mean, it's low tech, but I mean, it was is the only thing that really worked for this. Yeah, I was going to say, use an alternate form of communication to verify out yeah. of band whether that email is appropriate, whether you call someone, text them, or you you know you talk to your your IT manager and say, hey, are you guys rolling out this initiative? Does this make sense for what you guys are doing? Things like that. And. Uh, because I share the same domain as Frank. I understand the phishing emails you're getting. I get them three times a day. Um, let's say my mailbox is full of click on this, which you'd think we'd be able to um, fix by now, but I guess we can't. No, I think it's kind of interesting. Like, one of the most famous hackers of all time is Kevin Bitnick, and he admits he never compromised the system. Everything he did was in social engineering. He called on the phone, got passwords, and got in. He never exploited a software bug. Um, I, think that, I think that is kind of interesting to the, to the phishing thing. But I also think, as a company, um, I was helping out a, a company that was had a CISO who was just hell bent on sending out internal phishing emails to try to shame people, and that is a horrible way to do security. When you create a culture of fear and lack of trust, you just you just sink your security organization. You're already impeding them because just like you know, locking a door takes longer than, than leaving it unlocked by saying, okay, well now you're scared of everything. You, then these people just find ways around security. Yeah, that's an excellent point. I'm glad you mentioned the shaming of people because that's something that, you know, that that's awful to do because you make them feel bad, then they don't like you, and it it's not good all around. What we actually found in one of my previous companies is we used positive reinforcement for people who would report, you know, self-report security issues that they found within the environment, um, who would send us phishing emails, you know. The people who really stood out, we had a challenge coin. So I worked for a government agency, and so we had challenge coins, and that we found to be to be very successful. 
And then after people would receive them, going forward, they were much more security conscious. They would actually look for ways to help us out. Um, so positive reinforcement is huge if you're, if you're going to try and get people to kind of change their attitudes with this stuff. And, and I would add, there are also a couple of services these days that various security companies offer where they will deliberately fish your employee base and the people who click on the link then get taken to a training page with a, you know, sort of a big smiley face, oh, you shouldn't have clicked here, which is actually, I think, been statistically measured as, as working fairly well. Yeah. Yeah, they also drop USB sticks in the parking lot sometimes, too. And that's really interesting, especially when it's the 2015 financials. <laughs> Salary lists are good too. Yeah, yeah. yeah definitely. So, uh, is this thing? Yeah, okay. Uh, so, question on kind of the response to vulnerabilities. So, panel seems to kind of be in agreement that a lot of the vulnerabilities are particularly low tech, right? Like poor network segmentation techniques, effective social engineering techniques. Like I, you know, I popped your credentials, and now you know the you know the network thinks that I'm you. So, the proportional response that we'll get into a little bit in the R and D panel is around like where should we be spending our money? Right, and so like most companies are engaged in like the building of next generation firewalls or next gen whatever you want, and it's billions of dollars of outlay. But from a vulnerability analysis perspective, are, are those well aligned to mitigate low level vulnerabilities, um, or are the products that are being developed not proportional with the vulnerabilities that are exposed? I'd like to answer that question first. Um, for me, first and foremost, with these type of vulnerabilities, it's, it's awareness. It's getting our people to understand what it is first. Um, to get your non-technical people, not probably the people in this room, to understand what it is. And um, two, like, uh, like you were saying, positive reinforcement and enablement methods and using good measures to send out training. And, and getting a, getting a, like an awareness training suite that will not put you to sleep, or look at your Facebook as your video is drawing on, and make some investments there. It's a lot cheaper than that next generation, you know, Xbox One firewall or whatever it is you want to call it. It really is. It's a short-term tactical planning uh, for low-level issues that you can do really well. It's not. It's nothing's ever easy, but you can do it relatively easy. While you're doing that, you do need a long-term strategy. Where are we going? Uh, what does technology look like? What are the upcoming threats? The one, well, it's good and bad, I guess, is that uh, about what, three years ago, maybe four years ago, a lot of folks in this room, if, we, if you had a breach in your organization, well, your job is in jeopardy. Nowadays, um, your job is in jeopardy if you didn't have a plan when you get breached. So uh, the dynamics changed a lot. And again, this is at the forefront of me. Uh, so I think there's a lot of advantages, and we're kind of at the front end of this to really, really uh, get some awareness and uh, protect your, uh, you know, your own enterprises, protect your own government organizations, and frankly, you know, protect our society. <coughs> um, so I would say, as I said before, all vulnerabilities are cultural. And how you identify what culture is driving that vulnerability to exist. Is it an availability bias? Is it an economic bias to new features? What are the cultural components that are creating that, that pattern of vulnerability and how you can address it? Right? With, the, with IT networks, we used to defend the perimeter. And then we realized through lots and lots of negative feedback that that didn't work. And we had to get you know, very fast at scanning and patching. And we used to measure the, the time from a zero day to the time that it was being exploited in the wild. And then those, those dates inverted. It was being exploited in the wild before it was a zero day. We realized, okay, now this is not gonna work. So ultimately, every time I try to look at how vulnerabilities exist, I try to see what culture is creating that category of vulnerabilities and how can we address that organizationally. One of the things that I see in IT broadly is that we all do mature. We all are about repeatability and availability and performance and capacity and ITIL, telecommunications in particular. And at least I'm, a, I'm from the security operations world, same as Greg here. <laughs> ITIL is the death of security operations. <laughs> Anytime you do things in a very rigid, repeatable fashion, you're killing yourself. Because what does the adversary do? Change. 
Right. Yeah. They try something. If it doesn't work, they try something else. If that doesn't work, they try something else. And on the first time, they get the, they get the money and they move along. So they're the definition of agile. We can't defend against agile by using maturity. So that's a cultural component for that sort of vulnerability and detection. So I always try to go back to the organizational culture that's creating it. No, those are some great points, Chris. And I mean, that, that's the whole point. Is like changing behavior is one of the huge aspects I think of all of our all of our jobs, really, because that's the hardest part. Because cool, we can go in and you know add parameterized queries and whatnot to fix some SQL injection bug. But if you don't go the next step and teach the developer like why this is an issue, what can happen because of this issue, and then show them you know the whole picture, they aren't really gonna get it. And you know those be like, hey, I fixed this, you know. And, like I used to do a lot of web app pen testing and so some of the funny stuff I saw was like they would go as far as to completely disconnect the database just so I wouldn't find SQL injection. And it's like but that, you know, is, is completely <coughs> defeating the purpose of what we're all trying to do, right? So, so I think changing behavior is a huge aspect of it. So I, I do agree it comes back to cultural uh, issues essentially. Yeah, I guess to say the same thing in some different words. Um, it comes back and it's an, an old saying um, it goes to people, process, and technology or tools in that order. Um, where are we wanting to spend a lot of our money? Um, I would encourage you to not be upgrading your next generation firewall every year or two, but instead um, taking that, that money and that capital and investing it in your employees and your hires. Um, those guys that show promise and, and, and spunk and, and curiosity into security, um, really investing in them and giving them the time. Along, we can spend all this time closing all the holes, as I said earlier, you can't ever get rid of every vulnerability. Um, and you also have to start thinking, well, when are we going to stop spending money closing vulnerabilities and spending money on our ability to respond to that incident that's coming as well? Um, not if, but when. Um, so does your team have the tools and the skills um, and, and the, the context required for them to be able to respond and um, mitigate that incident as fast as possible so it doesn't become huge? I guess I'm going to buck the trend here a little and say next gen firewalls are awesome. <laughs> I do I do a lot of work with uh, federal law enforcement for some high profile um, uh, hacks, and what, what I don't I don't see um, James Bond style attacks. What I'm seeing are poor coding, really poor deployment, and I'm seeing that the majority of the time. Um, so I do think you definitely need to build um, security into your culture, but less focus on the end user and more focus on your IT group and your software developers. I'm still seeing the front doors open and the windows unlocked in the, in the computer world. I mean, we're seeing people still deploying IIS without being locked down. Um, things like deploying, just as an example, you know, an application server like Tomcat, and leaving the admin page open to the outside world. And any monitoring tool could pick up any, you know, any Nessus audit could pick that up, but people are doing it and this is how they're getting in over and over again. Um, so I think you know you can increase situational awareness. When are these attacks happening? Um, I was helping out with a recent hack where there was um, clearly nation state activity, and they were on the system for 18 hours a day for six months straight, and the internal group never knew. How, how, how do you not look at the web server log and see that? So I think you know things like a next-gen firewall will help. Are they the answer to everything? No, not at all. So that's a very good question, Alex. But um, you know. <coughs> That is one layer, because all your security is layered, right? You have to, you do have to still pay attention to the perimeter. It's not the panacea, a firewall doesn't block you, but you need that firewall, you need parameterized SQL, you need cross-site scripting protection, so you need good coding, you need to protect your data. So all these things together make you secure, it's not just this one thing. Yeah, and I guess it goes to the defense in depth, but I guess my point was that if you don't have the right people driving those systems to begin with, um, then those can be deployed just as insecurely as anything. Like, absolutely. I've seen a lot of money spent on, on security. Yeah. yeah, I've seen a lot of money spent to make security. Like, we bought security, right? But it never gets deployed. <laughs> yeah. That's a very good point. <laughs> you, you plug this in, it protects you from all the APTs, right? That's, that's how it works, right? <laughs> well, and, and I'm going to give another anecdote, but I have seen one of the most well-architected intrusion detection sensor grids deployed around an environment, logged into it, and realized that it had not had a signature update in five years. So it was only capable of archaeology, not detection. <laughs> yeah, one other suggestion. Um, I think everybody, a lot of people think this is an enterprise <coughs> problem. We need to change that too. It's, it's an enterprise problem. It's a problem for the entire organization, whether it's governmental, commercial, or nonprofit. 
that's what it's really got to be. You know, one of the things I'm trying to do in my organization is when people ask me what department I'm in, I tell them I'm in the security department. And they're like, oh, really? Okay, can you check my ID badge? Well, it's still a venue to get them to start talking. And then, you know, we start talking about proactive risk management, strategic risk management. I try not to say I'm working for MIT because we're actually not. And it does help because if I say that, then software engineers don't like IT for some reason. It's like firefighters and police, I guess. But uh, um, I'm a former cop, so I use a lot of analogies for law enforcement. But uh, it really, it needs to be a standalone organization. Eventually, it's, it's going to truly report to a CEO or a board of directors, kind of like the CFO does. It's just an evolution of, we'll probably see the next five, 10 years. You know, everybody here will be retired by then. But, uh, um, but yeah, that's where I see it going. So, thanks. So, um, question is over here. So, so the, uh, there was broad consensus on the panel that in the product development, that uh, more should be done to security, that the product development uh, schedule should include the cost and, and time to include security. But given this is, as I kicked it off, this is an interdisciplinary type of a, a discussion here. What if, or have you thought of, is this an economically rational approach? That is, that the cost of the security at this point in time of, of the intrusion is that that cost is, is is not weighed by outweighed by the benefits of the security that you're putting in. That is, you're better off. You're being rational by being reactive, rather than proactive. And if that's the case, maybe then uh, you need to address why is it is, is the cost of implementing security at this point in time too expensive? Is it because it's scarce and we don't have enough tra trained people doing this, or what's the reason that maybe Adam Smith's invisible hand is working here? And until we figure out a way to reduce the cost of implementing the security, maybe you're going to be waiting a while, or we have to wait until there's really much more cost associated with the, with the intrusion. Just, just some thoughts. I'd like to hear your reaction. Again, I think it's an evolution. Um, I don't know how long it took to get seatbelts in cars or how many people have had to die before we get seatbelts in cars, but I use that analogy. Uh, again, my role is to be a business advisor on risk. <clears throat> to talk about it. Uh, a business's role is to understand what the risk is and make a business decision to tolerate it or not. Uh, that said, if it's something that's life safety critical, like let's say seatbelts, I'll just use that analogy, it's just really easy, then there's really not an argument at the end of the day because then you wind up like GM, you know, with all their issues. Uh, but when you're talking about lower level risk, it's a business decision whether to execute against it or not. And I think businesses are taking a jaw in this die right now because they're seeing all the consequences of not building security into their products. And then you also have to realize there's a lot of companies who are selling manufacturing things that just aren't technologically based. Uh, and they're really more focused on an internal security for, let's say, food products and stuff like that. Uh, so it, it all depends on the sector, the level of risk, um, and, and, and then the business having a good understanding of what the risk actually is to kind of create that formula that you spoke of. But yeah, at the end of the day, it's, it's a lot about economics too. Seatbelts started out as an option. They were $200 a piece. If you wanted to get seatbelts with your car, you could pay $200 more. People didn't buy them, even though all of the statistics said they saved lives. Well, and, and I'm going to run with this seatbelt analogy just a little bit. I'm guessing here, so I don't, I don't know the answer, but I would have to guess that it wasn't the safety factor of seatbelts that put them into, into full deployment. I think it was the litigation. Um, and I think it was the you know, society saying, hey, wait a minute, we need to do something because our whole lives hinge on it. All of our information, everything we see, everything we do is now on technology. So you know, maybe we need to have somebody helping the... The, the invisible hand in here, otherwise known as maybe regulators. <laughs> I, I can take off a little bit on your analogy further, I think. Um, I'm a practitioner, I'm a CEO of a company locally, and uh, I can appreciate all that you're saying, 
I, I take a little bit of umbrage from the top because uh, I have to think of my business and the people that are on it sort of as a ship. And as was asked, I think, by Mr. Reed, um, how do I know when I'm going to put the right amount of money into the security such that I can still get my product to market in a window and at a value that customers will buy it so that I can continue to employ the cybersecurity people? I think you guys have, have generally bumped up against the answer mostly in the form of it requires communication and education. There's a question coming, I swear to God. <laughs> the the seatbelt analogy, just getting the seatbelt in the car isn't what eventually made them effective. It's getting people aware that that saved their lives to make them buckle it once it was there. And so how do I know when to buckle my seatbelt? How do you educate the top-level people such that we can... Um, make the right decision together? What's a good way to accomplish that? Right, now that was a great question. And I think um, what it comes down to, uh, you know, what we do essentially um, within our organization is we do a risk-based approach. So we try and show the risk that we know about. We show potential damage, potential impacts, potential lost revenue. And we try and show it in that way and do some, some you know, essentially weigh the costs and benefits. Show like, you know, if we don't do this, there's X that could possibly happen but might not happen. There's a good chance it won't happen at all. But I mean, the thing is, you have to you have to work with the business and move with the business. Because I've seen a lot of security teams try and just force things down the throat of organizations, and that never works out. Because you're the whole reason we're all here is to enable our business, and so that's the approach we take: is we enable the business and just show the risk, and we show you know kind of what might happen. Um, but that, that's the hard part. I mean, that's why it's a it's a really good question because finding that balance is different, and it varies significantly between every organization too. Don't forget benchmarks. Oh, yes. We love looking at everybody else's mistakes so we don't repeat them. Right. So. Yeah, and I guess to, to kind of continue on that, um, you have to, to take a very pragmatic approach, especially when you're a business that has profits and losses. You only have so much capital to work with to secure your products and, and get there. And then, so you can take a spin on it too um, and say, I have this product that I'm selling. And now you have companies such as HP or AT&T or First Data that say, I want to use your product. But first, you have to prove to me that you do all of this X, Y, and Z security. So security can actually become a, a marketing tool for you and saying, hey, you know, we've built this in from the get-go. Our competitors don't do this yet. You know, we're ahead of them um, in this area. And on top of that, we also have our own internal operational stuff together, too. Um, so we're, we're the company you want to partner with. You can, you can turn it around. Yeah, and, and to that, um, I think in, from, from putting features into a product, it needs to be thought of as, okay, well, what, what is the low-hanging fruit that we can do now that will help us get that sale? And if you get the right market, they're asking for more features, and you can figure out what you can put in to make it more sophisticated. Um, I teach a secure embedded class here, and uh, from some of our uh, electrical engineering students, the first day I asked, raise your hand if you think security will help sell an embedded product. And only one of the of the twelve EE students raised their hand. Luckily, the IDP students all raised their hand. But um, you know, it's just not thought of right now. Which people, the better people don't think about security. So I think the same could be held for most software. Yeah, well, maybe if you're selling to the right market, you should care. But if you're implementing security, one thing you could do is uh, I'm a, maybe I've just <laughs> had too much of the CMU Kool Aid. But Octane <laughs> is just a, a great method for trying to figure out okay, well, how far do we need to go? And nothing's perfect. There's that human. Um, there's that human factor in it where you say, well, this is what's more important to me. But I think it's a pretty good starting point. And something Paul said earlier, I just want to circle back on, was that his security group is not part of IT. And that is, that is critical. You won't have any teeth to, to stand behind your security if it's, if it's part and parcel of IT. Because IT will say, well, we've got all these requests from our, our, um, our user group saying we need this deployed, we need this deployed, we need this deployed. And you're telling me we need security, and that's going to slow it down, and that's going to make me look bad. So by keeping the two separate and having buy-in from the top down to have some power behind your security group is really, really important. We've got time for one more question. So the, uh, <coughs> the situation often occurs that I have built and secured my environment to the best as possible using a variety of best of breed and unknown and <coughs> all the other things that happen. And... Unknowns to us, one of those folks 
makes a change in a fundamental configuration of their world. And basically, uh, we end up in this situation where, you know, new defaults are to open rather than closed or different than they used to be. And this stuff propagates itself automatically throughout my world and suddenly the door is wide open, totally unknown to us. Can you speak to what you see happening in the industry and in the standards world and in the kind of the best practice world for these folks that may address those kinds of things? Because I think that gets to your issue of low hanging fruit. You know, we, billions of dollars of infrastructure deployed and all the check boxes are you know, green rather than red. Well, I'd go back to segregation of duties, first of all, especially if it's a critical, critical system. Uh, like our satellite operations center, and I don't want a big, giant red button anybody can push to shut down everything. It's you know, just not uh, common sense in the first place. So, I mean, you can just go back to physical security. It's the same thing, segregation of duties. Secondly, you just spoke to a classic insider threat. That's insider threat error, or it could be you know, intentional for whatever reason. Um, so there needs to be awareness. At the end of the day, you know, if there's a lot of technology people in here, some really, really smart folk, but at the end of the day, it's our people um, that create most of our risk, unfortunately, internally. And we have to create that awareness, uh, A, for them to understand how not to make mistakes, not to click on that thing, not to push that big red button. And B, um, you know, if you see something, say something. I hate to say it with all everything that's happening, but it's true these days. And if you do it internally, whether it's for an insider threat error or if it's intentional, or frankly, if it's workplace violence, active shooter, whatever you want to talk about, people need to speak up, and a lot of people don't want to do that. So it's not an easy problem to solve, but it's uh, but if you don't start, it, but you need to start somewhere. So start those programs if you don't have it. If you don't have those programs, start, start talking to people to figure out how to get those programs into your organizations. There really are a lot of low-hanging fruit and things that you can do. Um, I had a CISO show me a video once, and it was the security guard holding open the door at about 7 p.m. at night for a, a pharmaceutical researcher carrying two bags of printed paper out of the office, um, where they promptly boarded a flight for Shanghai and stole a bunch of research data. Um, what could they have done to detect that? Who was using the printer off hours? Turns out insiders very, very, very commonly will print out lots of material after hours. And it's a very simple thing to detect. So there's a lot of little, you know, sort of anecdotes of detection logic in order to identify people that are doing malicious things that you can deploy and detect. Um, and when Paul talked about separation of duties, retail banking uses this thing called maker, checker, doer. Someone does it, someone checks it, someone else implements it. Um, that's really expensive to implement in IT at times, but there are key points where maker, checker, doer does make sense. You know, I, I'd be careful because you don't want three FTE for every job in the environment, <laughs> but there's a balance there. So I think there's a lot of low-hanging fruit that, are, that people in security are aware of that could bring to that problem. Yeah, and I, I would agree definitely with the segregation of duties aspect because that's a critical component and also change management and tracking of that. But then again, I mean, we're talking about an unauthorized change right now where someone just went in. I mean, that could go, that could happen any time if someone has those permissions. Um, so that's like one of the one of the neat parts about my job is you know we kind of take the approach that there's someone already inside up to something, right? So we start looking at the correlation of, of events within the network already. So, you know, like the perimeter is great and all, but we want to see what's going on inside. We want to baseline our environment and then pick out the anomalies from that. And there's a lot of great toolkits out there to do that. You know, with our software, we do that. There's also the hunt teaming framework uh, Black Hills InfoSec just came out with, which is very cool. You can upload packet captures to that and it'll pick out weird traffic based on algorithms they wrote. Um, so, I mean, there's a lot of ways to do this. Uh, one of the fun things we've been doing a lot of lately is bugging documents and seeing where those go. Um, we gave a presentation, my boss and I gave a presentation a, about a month or two back, and we actually bugged our presentation to see like all the hops that took. And, and so, I mean, there's stuff like that, that you can do, but essentially the more eyes you get on this stuff, the more mature your security program gets, the more you're able to see, the more you're able to understand and actually take actionable uh, actions on when you see this, this stuff going on in your network. Yeah, it goes back to an age-old term of continuous monitoring. Um, basically, you're, you've configured your system and it gets to a stable point, but our systems are dynamic and they're always changing. 
Um, so we need to be able to monitor and make sure that they're behaving in an appropriate and, and expected manner. Um, and when anomalies do occur, we have the ability to detect it. Um, simple core scans from an untrusted network into the trusted side of it. Hey, why all of a sudden could I reach these 5x reports on this system when yesterday I could? Um, so you can take simple steps like that um, that really would answer um, basic questions. Or why, why does this machine always, it's always talking internally to these three servers, but now all of a sudden it's talking to, to Romania? Mm, flag should go up there. You know, so there's, there's simple things we can do. Um, whether this simple change would, would be easily detectable and, and stuff always depends on how much instrumentation you have in place and again the people that are there able to watch it and able to um, tune the system so that when these really important events do happen they're not just lost in the noise of the environment as well. Exactly what you said, continuous monitoring is key. It's not, I mean the, the question I used to ask when I did job interviews was, you know, when is security done? Why are you secure enough to stop worrying about it? It says, well, we need to do this and this. Okay, they're wrong. So um, something as simple as putting a box in the cloud and running Nmap against your network all the time and all of a sudden ports open up, getting those alerts for changes for something like your um, critical security measures. That should all be going to syslog somewhere. You should be getting alerts if things change. Um, and then, you know, for the insider threat, there's an interesting uh, number that came out of the software industry suit that was um, in 2013, over one in four attacks was from inside the company. And of those attacks, over half of them cost more than an external attack. So you know, keep, you, the day where we could say, I think you guys have all, all just hard on the floor, is you know, behind the firewall you're not safe. But just because they're in your company doesn't mean you're secure. So you have to think about the inside threat. And I guess another thing to add too, there's a pretty cool technology out there now um, considered configuration as code. Um, so you're configuring your systems and it's actually a configuration file that gets checked into a code repository. It's really easy to build into change management process, so the change is approved, the code is updated, it's pushed to the system. One of the benefits of it is if the system goes, it diverges from that configuration file, it'll actually heal itself and fix it and go back to that last configuration. Um, and then that way, um, the, the configuration change in the code, you now have an audit path to say who changed this parameter of this file. So, yeah. I, I would just add one last thing. Um, I don't think we can defend infrastructure anymore, but we can defend data. So I would try to narrow the problem to what really needs to be defended, encrypt it, protect it, and focus on defending the data that matters to your business rather than trying to generically defend your entire infrastructure. As a matter of fact, with hunt teams, I like to let them in in various places and see what they're doing and share that information with the rest of my security team. <coughs> Well, this is really insightful. We're a few minutes over. Um, I just have one quick question. How many, uh, how many folks in here in your organizations actually have a SOC? How many people know what a SOC is? Security Operations Center. Yeah, versus just a regular NOC. So I think that's part of the problem. Uh, we, just, we just don't have a central repository a lot of these organizations. So with that, uh, we're done with this piece. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.